What's up, podcast listeners? This is your host, Rafael Majeshevsky, and this episode is going to be super, super visual, um, but that could be a lie because I tend to talk a lot. But today, we're going to go over my entire progressions of how to effectively kettlebell swing because uh, a couple weeks ago, I've been chatting with a few people on my Instagram about uh, kettlebell training, kettlebell swings in particular, and I thought I might as well, up one, update my tutorial on uh, kettlebell swings, but two, um, showcase the steps and what's needed in order to swing effectively because people, uh, I want to pour battery acid in my eyes when I see terrible, terrible swings online. But before we get into that, I need to do some shout outs. Um, new number one city all the way in Texas, a city named Sugarland, Sugarland, um, and number two, all the way in Ohio, the city of Columbus, and number three, we, in the city of Las Vegas. Shout out to everyone in Vegas listening to my show. That's super cool. Um, okay, let us chat about kettlebell swings. Um, I think the whole notion of kettlebell swings is one of those exercises where they look really really cool um you know it gets your heart rate up works super super hard looks badass so everyone wants to do it i get it i get it but it is one of those exercises that requires quite a bit of prerequisites kind of like you know the deadlift um the back squat things like that you know what i mean like but for some reason, everybody wants to swing. So I'm happy to showcase this episode where we're going to get into the nitty gritty of it. So the biggest thing that I see, let's, go, let's start with common mistakes. People do the American swing, which got popular from CrossFit. I've done multiple posts on this, but a quick little summary. Um... In order to swing a kettlebell overhead, the amount of force that kind of comes down with it to slow it down kind of eliminates a lot of, you know, control in kind of the lumbopelvic area. So you end up kind of doing more harm than good. Um, the other caveat to that is having enough overhead mobility to actually get a weight swinging as high as possible because really when you get a good hip snap at the top of the swing um, the bell can only go so high so the rest of it becomes like this dynamic like front raise overhead and as people fatigue I'm pretty sure holding that bell up there tends to be quite dangerous so I never do American swings, people do. Again, is it wrong? At this point, I'm gonna say yes. If you wanna argue with me, go ahead. But um, I'm always on that side of you know, risk over reward. And plus, no one's paying you to compete in the CrossFit games, so you don't have to do the American swings. So might as well just do regular swings. Just think about it. Um, number two would be people doing a squat to front raise swing thing. Um, that just goes to show that no one really knows anything about swings if you see that in the gym or if you're doing that currently. You have like zero knowledge of kettlebells in general, but a lot of people do that, so they need to kind of get educated. Um, and I would say number three is doing something I've never seen before. This usually pops up once or twice a year on my Facebook feed where, you know, someone tags me in a video and people are just, I don't even know how they move their body to swing the kettlebell that way. So a lot of ways to do it wrong. And there are certain things you need to be able to do before you start swinging. So I think to start this all off is um, breathing. And what's going to be funny is, um, I said this in my previous videos, a lot of my programming 
um, will have an emphasis on other exercises, but the same kind of concept to reiterate it over and over and over and over again. So when I get into this section for kettlebell swings, you're gonna notice that it's very, very, very similar to the deadlift, right? So if I can get someone deadlifting with good form, the next logical step is to now let's make it more dynamic. You already have the foundations, we can challenge it, right? But um, a lot of people skip that. So number one is breathing. Um, if you get into um, the Dragon Door certification, Strong First certifications, they have something called the Dragon's Breath. So if you think of every like MMA, boxer, kickboxer, whatever it is, every time they throw a punch, a kick, they have that tss, tss, that little breath to drive more power. And the moment you do that, you create more intra-abdominal pressure to kind of brace for the dynamic movement. Uh, when people fuck up their breathing in kettlebell swings, it's like over and they're kind of flopping all over like a noodle and higher risk of you know um, injury. And it's just like the deadlift. If your breathing sucks in the deadlift, bad things tend to happen. So that's number one. And we've gone over breathing. So if you haven't seen my other videos on like low back pain, um, creating um, kind of like a strong core and things like that, look up those episodes previously, and I go in depth on breathing. Essentially look for diaphragmic breathing. The second thing would be at that point where you can hinge effectively, like you can distinguish between I'm gonna squat and I'm gonna hinge. A lot of people skip the steps. So if you don't know how to deadlift and squat, then swings are not gonna work out for you that well. Um, and then the next thing would be, um, learning the movement pattern. And that's where we're going to kind of go through, um, here is kind of like a hands-on portion of this, uh, episode. So for all those listening, I'm going to try to be as descriptive as possible, but highly recommend you hit the show notes and watch the video from this point on. So how do I get someone swinging? We already covered breathing, say for the sake of this video, I've taught you how to breathe and boom, that's it. Number two is going to be learning the hinge. And this is where um, I implement my kettlebell stuff. So I'm gonna tilt this guy down. Hopefully that's gonna be enough for him. So I'm gonna grab my 20 kilo kettlebell. And I believe you can see me. So, um, hinge. What I like to do, this is actually a big thing. Um, a lot of times when people try to just deadlift off the floor, they make this mistake where they have the weight in front of them. And when they reach down, their arms are kind of too far forward. So if I end up lifting from this position, the fulcrum becomes my lower back. So every single rep, a lot of stress goes into that lumbar region. But if I go over top where the handle portion of the kettlebell is right directly underneath me, now when I reach down for it, the fulcrum becomes more of my hamstrings and glutes and I can use those to drive up and lock out. So to initiate that first little bit of learning the dynamic movement of the swing, I start with kettlebell deadlifts. And in my programming, this is one of the things that I've already worked on. So when I get to the point of teaching my own clients how to swing, we've already covered this and I don't have to worry about it. So for people who are watching who don't have my programming, you're gonna have to start here. So again, shoulder width apart with the feet, a little bit wider depending on what feels good. Knees come out as I go down into the hinge. I'm gonna grab the kettlebell, squeeze the handle like I wanna break it, and I wanna hide my armpits to be super tight. A lot of people lose tension by just leaving the shoulders where they're at. So hide the armpits, squeeze, deep diaphragmic breath in, hold and exhale and drive up, and then back down. So I coach that the moment you're coming up, I want as fast as possible. I want that butt squeeze as hard as possible, right? Um, when 
I get people learning how to do that? The nice thing is that um, I'll usually couple it with a dynamic glute bridge. So I will get them, say, doing six reps, eight reps of the uh, deadlift. And then from there, um, going into a kind of a dynamic uh, glute bridge to kind of reinforce that pattern over and over and over and over again. So then they kind of understand that, you know, when I drive through, I am squeezing as hard as possible, like I'm trying to literally jump forward. And that's one of the cues that I give people is like, think about you doing a broad jump. Like if I'm standing and I decide to jump forward as far, far as possible, I'm gonna push my hips back and try to drive through Kind of like the same thing if I was going to try to jump as high as possible, I am going to um, use my hips almost like a snap at the top. Um, and this comes down to the coaching and it's things that I want you to think about when it comes to um, the kettlebell swing. From there, say I've, you know, the perfect hinge, I'm doing great and I'm snapping my hips like no tomorrow. Now I'm gonna go into more of kind of like the setup. So another big thing that I see people do with kettlebell swings that they screw up right off the bat is starting the kettlebell swing from this position and they kind of just, they just do this thing and then they kind of, all right, I'm doing my swing, right? So that's not the best and effective way to produce force and power in this exercise. The easiest thing is having the bell out in front of you and from this position you're going to tilt it on an angle towards you and from here is where you would start because now I have a little bit of momentum to get the bell swinging in the right direction that it's supposed to and it just makes your life easier. So the next kind of step is adding kind of like I call it like hiking the football where I'm going to take the bell behind me and place it back behind me place it back so I'll go here so I'm literally just throwing it behind uh, my legs to initiate that first motion and it's super super important to get into these good habits because um, when you forget to do those habits, you're gonna have a lot of energy leaks. You have a higher chance of hurting yourself. So when you saw me do it, I placed the kettlebell back to where I started. And then you wouldn't know if I'm starting or putting it back. It has to look identical. Because when you're done a set of 10, 15, 20 swings, whatever it is, the last thing you wanna do is like bend your entire spine over and just plop it down you're probably going to injure yourself. Any time where you take away the tension from your body in a dynamic movement like the kettlebell swing, bad things tend to happen. So, that being said, when I place the kettlebell down after I finish a set of swings, I still have my tension, that um, safety, security around my spine, so then when I place it down, things don't fall apart. So, good habits when it comes to kettlebell swings go a long way. Now, from there, I take the person to, I call it a power swing. Um, I don't know what the official name is, but um, essentially when I get people comfortable with the swing, like swing um, startup and setup, um, I teach them the power swing, which is basically one kettlebell swing and that's it, right? So say I programmed eight power swings, I tell every client or person that I work with to think of um, basically eight sets of one rep. So I want the emphasis on the start and finish as one single, single thing so then there's no floppiness or weird stuff that happens because there's a lot of variables in a swing and I find a lot when clients try to learn this for the first time and if I, I made this mistake before where I'm like, all right, we're just gonna go 10 swings and they just flop everywhere, it looks terrible. You're like, oh shit, like what is that? Um, so it's easier just to like 
focus on one thing and then at the reset I'll always kind of give a couple more cues like oh do this instead make sure you do this make do do that and then they can kind of remember those cues and try to put it into practice so power swing how that's gonna look I'm gonna make this a little bit lower so we have the setup and then from here After every swing, I place it down. There was a lot that just happened there. Um, the big thing to remember is taking your time to think of every single next repetition. A lot of people skip that and they just want to get through as fast as possible. And that's not the best way to get those swings. So a lot of things happen there. The setup and the put down have to look the same. The second thing is the hip snap. A lot of times when people do this and they, I think you can see me, when they get to the top, they don't have that pop. Like I literally tell people like the moment you get to the top, you want to think of like your butt cheeks, like slapping together as hard as possible. Like you are holding a hundred dollar bill between those cheeks and someone's trying to pull it out and you're just, you're like, no, that's not happening. And a lot of times people make this mistake where when they get to the top, they kind of just, they kind of just do this thing, you know, they're doing their swing and it's not that powerful and it's just kind of sloppy. And a lot of times what that means is people just don't have that intra-abdominal pressure. So it could be their breathing, but most of the time is that they don't have a strong enough core to stabilize them through this motion. And I would argue that probably 90% of the time people fall in that category because they miss so many steps. It's kind of like when people do the barbell back squat and you see them as they're coming up and they're struggling, they kind of like collapse with their upper body and then they kind of try to drive through because they don't have a strong enough core to create that intra-abdominal pressure. So, um, that being said, we would have to scale it back, teach a person how to breathe, teach a person how to properly brace, teach a person some basic core progression, because let's face it, everyone who trains, they wanna do like the hardest core exercise known to man for some reason, and that just doesn't make sense to me. Um, anyway, the other facet to that that I see a lot is sometimes with women um, if they had a pregnancy recently 10 years ago whatever it is if they haven't properly um, rehabbed from that from you know seeing a pelvic floor physio whatever it is they probably won't be able to create that tension and relax it create that tension and relax it because depending on the pregnancy um, you know it could have been like the perfect pregnancy, delivery, whatever it is, and everything goes back to normal like it should. But most of the time, that doesn't really, really happen. So, um, that tension is not gonna probably happen unless they fix pelvic floor function. So highly recommend if you are a woman listening or watching this video, um, and you've had a child and you've never seen a pelvic floor physio, 100% go check one out because that could be that missing link for whatever you're trying to achieve in the gym. And it's most apparent to things like swings, deadlifts, back squats, any max tension, max like PR exercise you can think of. So highly recommend that. Um, the other thing that people screw up with the swing and it's from that first star position if you remember before, from here, driving it back, people don't get their hands, I'm gonna turn around, um, as far back as possible, because one is just no one's really taught them, or they don't really grasp the concept. Like I tell dudes that essentially when you go back, you're trying to hit the boys, and at the very last minute, you're getting out of the way. Um, there's another joke in, 
the kettlebell world is when you get certified uh, through the RKC Strong First, whatever it is, the instructors will know if your hands are going in the right position uh, because when you use chalk for kettlebell swings and you know your hands are always kind of going in between your crotch essentially, you would have chalk on the bottom of your ass. So um, you basically want to get there as high as possible without hurting yourself and that gives you the best kind of arc when the bell goes up and back down and um, I don't know where I'm going with that but that's essentially what you want to think of is having your hands as close to the crotchal area as possible to have more of a powerful swing. Um, the other thing that I see is people losing tension up top and remember the little um, cue I gave of hiding the armpits that keeps those lats engaged, that tarries um, major as well to keep everything packed here. A lot of times people lose tension and they kind of flop. The other thing too is a lot of times people try to swing and then they end up doing a front raise regardless. So what I tell people to do is I want you to think of just getting your kettlebell like right underneath the pec line. You don't have to go any higher, especially when you go heavier like Think of you swinging a 32 kilo kettlebell. The last thing you want to do is a front raise with it because that's just going to hurt your elbows. And now that we're talking about the elbows, the one thing in swings that I see people do a lot is this lockdown position with the kettlebell. And again, when you go heavy enough, that's not going to feel good. So what do you want to do with swings is a slight bend. So when I swing a 32 kilo kettlebell, 20, usually it's anything above 24 kilos. I never aim any higher than this. So if you're watching, I'm like right underneath where my pecs are and I have a slight bend. So you, now you see how high the kettlebell goes. So if I'm here to only here, I have more of a powerful arc and I can create more force and I can get more swings um, faster compared to driving the kettlebell up overhead like American swing. So again, if the goal is muscle mass and fat loss, then it would make sense that if I'm doing a kettlebell workout, I want to get as many swings as possible and get my heart rate up. I can do that a lot more effectively and faster by getting that smaller arc like the Russian kettlebell um, community does compared to the American swing where I try to bring it above my head and then bring it back down. Um, that being said, it's a snap at the top every single time. One thing I do like to do when clients don't really get that tension thing or they just need a little bit more of it, um, if I get my hands on top of each other, arms out straight, all I would have to do is now take my hand on top and I tell the person, resist me. And I push down and they're trying to resist me and they feel that at the top of their kind of core musculature. I'm like, that's the tension I want you to feel at the top of the swing. So when you get to the top of the swing, I tell people it's literally a front plank. So imagine you're doing a front plank and it's like getting close to that 30 second mark and you're like just bracing and holding on for dear life. That's how you should feel at the top of the swing. And then the moment you come down to finish up your little arc, that's where you kind of let go of the tension. And at the top, as you're driving up, you're creating more tension, creating more tension. And as you get to that finished position, full body tension, like you're, freaking armored like nothing's gonna move you you're like just solid so those are those things that happen have to happen and have to have in your head in order for a, an effective swing um, when I get to that power swing um, level or time in the person's training from there it almost becomes a practice thing it's a skill Right? I've given them all the tools in order to perform the exercise. Now it's like practice it. Because sometimes it's just like the timing. People just need to kind of flow through it. So I'm going to do about five swings, how they're supposed to look, and to kind of give you a better idea. So I'm going to move back a little bit. So, 
that is how properly executed swings should look like. Um, a lot of people just need the tension, the timing, the hip snap at the top, and everything's gonna kind of come together. Um, the big thing is the breath. People screw up the breath a lot, and I kind of mentioned it earlier, but if you think about that dragon's breath, that tss, tss, I breathe through my nose and exhale through my mouth, and one, it helps preserve the amount of oxygen that you use, and be, you become a little bit more aerobically um, fit, more aerobically efficient. That's a better way to describe it. You become more efficient at using your energy and your breath, and I'm already out of breath. Um, so it's one of those habits I need to get into. A lot of people are kind of embarrassed to like make that much noise, but honestly, it's gonna save you a lot of headache down the road if you're seriously considering using kettlebells to your advantage in your training. So that was a lot of information I just gave, and I usually break down swings in like a 12 week continuum of training rather than like, here's a kettlebell and just like fucking go. But um, you people need to understand it's practice and when you don't have those fundamentals and you're trying to do other things with kettlebells, you're going to injure yourself. Um, I've seen too many times where people are doing way too advanced variations with kettlebells and things just, things are gonna hurt, honestly. Um, the other thing that I wanted to bring up with kettlebells is you gotta do it barefoot. You, honestly, like you're leaving a lot on the table if you are in shoes. I get that you might be at a gym where they don't allow you to um, take off your shoes, but you know if you can sneak in um, just wearing socks instead of your shoes, you're gonna get a lot more feedback in your feet and you'll be able to strengthen them. So my last episode about, you know, your feet, your toes and your ankles, that kettlebell swings is gonna help a lot if you have flat feet, no arches or high arches or whatever it is, it's gonna help a lot. Um, the biggest thing with swings is to practice with good form. Choose a kettlebell that's heavier than what you are using right now a lot of times when people have a kettlebell that's too light, it just doesn't, it doesn't work, you know? Um, I always suggest like for dudes that I am training, like guys, men, I usually for swings will use like a 20 kilo to a 24 kilo. Um, for women, um, depending kind of where they're at, it's between like 12 and 16 kilos, just something that allows them to brace and um, focus on the task at hand. But if you guys have any questions about swings, um, let me know, hopefully this was helpful. Um, there's a lot more to it, because a lot of times when I see swings, what I'm saying right now might not work for one person, and there's like 60 other ways to get the message across to what I wanna see on the gym floor. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out hit the show notes, add me on Facebook, on Instagram. I do post a lot of video and photo stuff. And for those who are listening, 100% hit the show notes and watch the video. Um, that's it for me, you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys are amazing. Until next time.